you were a cotton mill worker in the early 19th century, you'd spend most of your time toiling away in there, upwards of 70 or 80 hours a week. But what was life like for ordinary people outside of the factories? As a wealthy mill owner, you needed to squeeze everything you could out of your labour force. So what, if anything, could you do to improve the lives of your employees? And more importantly, how did you spend your money? In part one, we experienced what a working day was really like inside the cotton mills and how ordinary people were treated on the factory floor. This time, we delve into the home lives of those workers, men, women and children, going behind closed doors to see where they ate, slept and socialised. So this oh, wow, okay. is the very solid porridge, the sort of thing they would have been given. We're at Quarry Bank in Cheshire, built by the industrialist Samuel Gregg in the 1780s and expanded by generations of the same family. Here, we'll discover that your experience of the Industrial Revolution could be very different, depending on who you were. A lot of mill owners um, took a lot of pride in what they did, and that's probably the reason why he, he built this house here. And the wealth you had to your name. I'm heading to one of the oldest buildings at Quarry Bank, the accommodation block for child labourers. Its function might seem shocking today, but at the end of the 18th century, it was seen as a vital part of the cotton business. We know that in the first 50 years of production at the cotton mill, around half of the workforce was made up of children and many of them lived here in this building as indentured apprentices, bound to serve their employer until the ends of their contracts. That meant some kids might not be able to leave this place for 10 years or more, and there were big consequences if they tried. Hi, Erin. Hi, How are you Lee. doing? I'm good, thank you. Right, I've arrived for my first day at the apprentice house. What are the kind of checks and processes that happen as soon as a kid arrives here? So first of all, when you're brought to be hopefully an apprentice at this mill, you'll be checked over to make sure you're free from disease, to make sure there's no illnesses that are going to be spreading throughout the mill. You'll also go through a general health and fitness check because we need good, robust workers. And we'll also make sure you're the right age. So you have to be nine years old to work at the mill. But most of the children would be coming from the workhouse, so they wouldn't have any papers, any baptism certificates or any way of proving how old they were. So they had to find out the age by doing a certain something. They'd have to put one arm in the air, yep. put it over the top of the head, and if they could touch the earlobe on the other side of the head, yep. that meant they were nine years old. Did it? Above. Is that scientific? Not the most scientific way <laughs> of finding out someone's age, but uh, that's what they had to do. OK, really. brilliant. So I've passed that test, hopefully free of diseases. Uh, what's next for me? If you passed all the tests, then you are indentured into the mill. That contract is signed and you are tied to the mill and you're bound to the mill and you have to stay for the length of your indenture, which is commonly about 10 years long. Right. I mean, maybe I didn't want to pass that test then. Um, right, I'll, I'll follow you. Let's go inside. Yep. First up, I'm checking out the sleeping arrangements where privacy was non-existent. One of the spacious bedrooms, I'm guessing. Yes. How many boys are we talking at, at, at any one time? Are they sharing beds, for example? This, this, these are probably quite generous for one person, aren't they? Yeah, certainly not one person to a bed. They were two to a bed, so they did share the beds, and there was about 30 boys here at any one time. Now, one thing that we've kind of learned is how long they spent in the mill. How, how long do they actually get to, to come and sleep here? I mean, presumably they're not getting there eight hours a night. Well, they uh, would be exhausted, certainly, after doing a 12-hour shift working in the mill. 
that shift would usually finish at about 7pm and they'd come back here, they'd have lots of chores to get done and they might even have a lesson from the schoolmaster if he was available, you know, getting on for bedtime for some of the youngest ones. So it would be quite late by the time the head hits the pillow. Yeah, and I'm guessing no time for play like on a, on a working day, right? It's work, bit of lessons, straight to bed, up to do the same thing the next yeah. day. And you'll be exhausted, so you might not have the energy to play, even if you did have some free time given to you. Okay, so this must be the girls' dormitory, right? It is. This is where all the girls slept. So this one's quite a bit bigger. That's it's because there's more of them, right? Yes, they preferred female apprentices. So there was about twice as many girls to boys, 60 girls and 30 boys. There would be a few more beds in here as with the boys' dormitory, but they'd share the beds two to a bed so they could fit all 60 girls in this one room. And so each girl also has, uh, is this a, is a chamber pot under here? Yes, that's your chamber pot. Okay, Toilet brilliant. for night time. Okay, so no, no indoor toilets in here, I'm guessing. No, we do have the privies outside, but at night, all the apprentices were locked in the house. Really? So if they needed the toilet at night, the chamber pot was the only option because they couldn't make it outside to the privies. Okay, and I, I can't help but notice these sort of red cloaks that we've got over here. Um, they look slightly sinister if anyone's been watching uh, recent dramas on TV, but uh, what are these for? <laughs> so these red cloaks would be what the girls would wear to go to church on a Sunday. And it's a nice wool cloak to keep them warm on the way to church. And it's a nice smart uniform to wear to church, keep them all looking uh, sensible and smart. But also if a girl tried to run away wearing one of these bright red cloaks on the way to church, she could be spotted a mile off. Since I'll be stuck here for a while, I'd better see what I'll be eating. There are a lot of children living here, about 90 children at any one time, so lots of mouths to feed, lots of food to be making. Something tells me that the Greggs are going to make sure that they're, the children are well fed, but it's not going to be too expensive to feed them. Exactly, yeah. It was quite a staple diet, and uh, they were a bit luckier here than they would have been in the workhouse where they wouldn't have had access to maybe some of the more fresh produce that we're able to grow in the vegetable gardens ourselves. So vegetables made up quite a staple part of their diet, potatoes and things like that, but also oats made up uh, a staple part of the apprentice's diet as well. Easy meals to make. Yeah, I can see sort of peas and um, all, all kinds of like lentils and things here. I mean, so the, the kids themselves were growing them outside, were they? Yeah, so the boy, the, the boys would help with the, uh, the vegetable gardening. It was their chores, really, to go and tend to the, the plots outside. I'm presuming this kitchen would be firing up and, and going all day, right? So because the, the, the meals were taken from here up to the kids when they were working in the mill, or would they come back to eat here? That was the case with the breakfast. So when they got up in the morning, nice and early, at 5.30, they had to start their shift at 6am and they'd work for one hour before they got fed their morning porridge. Their oh, morning that's not too bad. And that porridge would be brought to the mill yard for the apprentices and they'd have 15 minutes to eat the porridge and then they'd be sent back to work. So this oh, wow. is okay. the very solid porridge, the sort of thing they would have been given. And that's because they didn't eat it out of a bowl. There was lots of mouths to feed and they had only 15 minutes to, to eat the porridge. So they'd all have to line up holding out their right hand. Right. It's very important that it was your right hand that you held out. They'd all then receive a nice big dollop of this porridge into their hand and they had to uh, eat it from the hand, lick the hand clean before they got back to work. That's not the most appealing start to the day, but it could get much worse by the end of it. Okay, so we've got a pot that says leeches on it here. Um, what on earth are they doing in the kitchen? So uh, a common problem amongst the mill workers, a common complaint, was eye irritation because these cotton spinning machines are running 12 hours a day. All that fibre that's going to be in the air coming from the machines, it'd get into your eyes and irritate them. They're going to swell up, a lot of blood is going to build up in your eyes and it'd be a lot of pressure. So to aid with that, to get rid of some of that swelling, leeches were employed. I can show you them if you'd like to. Let's have a look. Oh, brilliant. So you've got an eye complaint. You go to the Greg's doctor and he says, 
great, I, I've got exactly the thing that's gonna sort you out and he shows you one of these. Where, where, where is the leech going? It would be, well, there'd be quite a few of them placed around your eyes and your temples, hopefully to take all the excess blood away and relieve the pressure so you can open your eyes a, a bit easier. Well, that might be one way to get out of lessons, which were often taught at the end of an exhausting day of work. One of the things that would have taken place in this room is the lessons from the schoolmaster. So, I've got some slates here, of course, we used to write on. And what was the level of schooling that they would have had? You mentioned earlier it might have been after they got back from work or on a Sunday. Was it just a few hours a week? It was. So, the boys would get one hour a week. It was a, a basic education and everyone, boys and girls, would get taught reading and writing but then only the boys would get taught maths because the girls weren't seen as needing maths for their career prospects. So it was just the boys that got taught maths. What are the dumbbells that we have on the table here for? So this is another sort of punishment. So if a child was misbehaving, the punishment was to uh, give them two of these and they'd stand in a T-shape for about 20 minutes and it would get really painful. On are they the heavy? They're not, they're not too heavy. You can a go if you'd like. But also standing there it's also helping to build muscle, keeping your workforce, workforce strong for the mill as well. I see, they're always thinking about making sure their, their workforce uh, exercise. are as productive as possible. And if those child workers ever did get out of line, they could always be reminded of the contract they'd signed up to. We've got some indentures here which was the contract that was signed once the apprentice started work for the mill and this was a contract tying the apprentice to the mill for an agreed length of time, usually 10 years. And once that was signed, they couldn't leave if they wanted to find work elsewhere like the adults were able to. The apprentices had to stay for the length of their indenture. And we have Sam Gregg's name up there, Samuel Gregg of course. And so the interesting thing about this particular contract is that we know that John Halser ran away, right? He did. And if we turn the indenture over, we can see the cost of him running away. So if you ran away, someone had to be sent to fetch you, to bring you back because you had broken the terms of your contract and you weren't allowed to leave. So when you got back here, you'd be punished in the form of a fine and that fine would consist of the time you've missed from work and the cost of the, the person who's been sent to fetch you back. For all that the owners here did to keep the children's minds and bodies healthy, it wasn't a particularly fun childhood. The records show that between 1792 and 1837, 46 apprentices tried to run away. And who can really blame them? In the end, it was simple economics that convinced the Gregg family to end the apprenticeship system at Quarry Bank. New laws and regulations meant that hiring free labour, adults and children who weren't indentured, became cheaper than keeping children housed and fed on site. The whole scheme had been abandoned by 1847, by which time the Greggs had made a fortune from their work. This is Quarry Bank House, home to Samuel Gregg and his wife Hannah. Now, in many ways, the Greggs were not traditional masters. They chose, for example, in 1796 to build their family home literally metres away from the cotton mill where they employed hundreds of child labourers. Living here allowed Samuel Gregg to be at the very heart of the whole operation. During the period from 1760 to 1829, the value of English cotton exports, on which the region's wealth was based, rose from an average of £200,000 to over £37 million a year. Coming from a non-conformist merchant family with links to plantations in the Americas, Samuel Gregg was already a man of some wealth by the time Quarry Bank Mill was established. However, once the mill had been up and running for a decade or so, 
the Greggs had risen to be among the greatest of the Northern Cotton Kings. In the eyes of the industrialists, their businesses were at the forefront of progress, and the working classes better get used to it. While the labour force toiled away next door, the Greggs had a space for entertaining guests that still felt somewhat private. Quarrybank House was close enough to the mill for a very short commute, but lush greenery around the home meant it was kept out of sight. So, Sue, here we are, Quarry Bank House, the family home of Samuel, Greg and Hannah. Yeah. I mean, the elephant in the room here is just the sheer proximity of this family home to the mill where they have child labourers working sometimes up to 14 hours a day. Is that abnormal? No, it's not actually, no, because you'll find that a lot of mill owners um, took a lot of pride in what they did. And that's probably the reason why he, he built this house here. It was considered to be a, a family retreat or a, a weekend cottage, you know, summer sort of thing. But obviously around this time you have the Industrial Revolution taking hold in Manchester. And frankly, Hannah was not happy about bringing up all her children, uh, all 13 of them, in the, um, in the sort of confines of industrial Manchester. Yes. Um, the girls and the boys needed to be educated in her eyes equally. Uh, so by 1815 or so, he had in actual fact put a two-storey extension on the side of this house and it doubled the size of this house oh, here. Oh right, okay. So that meant the entire family moved in here, probably from somewhere around about the 1815s, 1820s or so, and this became their permanent residence. Oh, well, yeah. Should we have a look inside? Yes, yes. Let's go in, go. I'll take my hat off. <laughs> This. Very yeah. grand, isn't it? Yes, typical Georgian house. You'll see we've got two curved doors here and curved yes. walls. Yes, that's the first thing I noticed actually, these curved doors. Was that, yeah. was that unusual? Or? Um, some Georgian houses did have them, but I, I obviously you've got to appreciate it in those days. It's a little bit of what we, we term as hidden wealth. Well, speaking yeah. of their wealth, it's a new class of industrialists, isn't it? Yes, and, it is. uh, but in relative terms, just how wealthy are they compared to other aristocrats? I was going to say fairly wealthy, okay. right? But again, this house I always feel is understated. Yeah, it does feel very, it feels very homely. But yes, I, I do notice a lack of sort of. There's no grand paintings Tings on the walls no, or anything. No hanging, dangling chandeliers. And exactly. Uh, yes, yes, and yeah. that's all intentional. That's, I think yes, I think it probably is. Yes, that's nice. the sort of people they were. Obviously, being of the Unitarian religion as well, they were sort of you know, fairly sort of thinking people as such yes well so, should we have a should we have a look around I'll, I'll follow I'll you show, um, if you want to come and look at this because this is a uh, the original 1796 wooden cantilever staircase oh wow and as you can see it, it is quite spectacular and here we have a painting of Samuel Gregg and his beloved wife Hannah. Hannah. Let's talk a bit about how these two met. I, he's about 60 in this yeah. portrait here, she's about 19, but they actually aren't too that, dissimilar in no, age, are they? No, it's about five, six years between them. Okay. Apparently they met, at, I'm not quite sure where, but it was in Manchester at a, a social dance. As such. Okay, that's cute. Um, <laughs> like it that. is, isn't it, actually? But I mean, obviously Hannah already had a dowry. She had about £10,000 um, because her father died when she was about... 11 or 12, I understand, I think. Samuel himself was, was adopted um, mm -hmm. by an uncle in Belfast, and he also had a dowry as well. Um, so I that's liked, quite a significant it is, amount it of is, money isn't it, to be actually, able to invest in Yes, a, yes. I think he like obviously this. didn't invest it all, but a lot of it did, was invested in the mill here. I always like to think he pursued her because she was not actually... Um, all that are interested in in the first place, apparently. Ah, um, okay. So he, he actually uh, uh, pursued her, and as I said, they, they had a obviously a family, thirteen children. Yeah. From what we can understand, they, they were a, a devoted couple. This is the dining room. Okay. Um, we have this set up as a, a Georgian meal, and you'll probably notice that we've got quite a few serviettes out here. Yes, okay, so this is where they would have been entertaining yes, guests their, their as guests, well as their family. As well as their family, yes, yes. So you've, you've sort of got various business people here, members of the family. And so I guess by this house being here, Sue, I mean, that is evidence in and, in and of itself that he was thinking about work, he wanted to be yes, at the heart of the operation. Yes, yeah. You know, did he have time to sort of relax? Was, or was his mind always 
focused on work and it, it entertaining guests. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of a difficult one because I mean, obviously, he, he's, some of the guests that he entertains are also um, sort of businessmen business whom he, he might yeah. want to sort of impress. Um, and I also at the same time, he's also sort of got family members here as well, whom obviously he will, you know, like to chat to and yeah. switch off. But I think you'll, you'll probably find that, um, I mean, I would imagine he probably went to the mill at least once a day. Once a day. He, he didn't think... like, <laughs> yes, he, he did like to see her, although he had mill managers, etc., and people yeah. running the mill for him. He obviously wanted to sort of keep a, a good eye on, on what was going on. Hence the proximity here, you know, to, to the mill as such, yeah. And I know this is a, a, a modest, fairly modest uh, property See? as yeah. some summer states go, but uh, I guess they would have been eating quite well, or at least better than the uh, workers in the uh, mill. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. In actual fact, the cellars in the kitchens do run un underneath the house here. Um, they had sort of servants and a cook. But yeah, uh, yeah. and Let's obviously... Oysters. And oysters, yes, yeah, so you've got the jelly, you've got your pies here as well. Um, apparently, uh, I understand that the various designs on the top of the pies uh, would be referenced to what was actually in the pie as well. Ah, okay. Yes. And we have a load of sort of interesting guests uh, yep. here. Were there any particular uh, guests of note that came to Quarry Bank, Bank House? Well, I think this one here is very interesting. This is uh, John James Alban. Now, he uh, was a very, very famous artist. Okay. Um, but he was also very, I'm going to say he also had quite a few strong views on slavery as well. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, Samuel did have um, a, a slavery plantation, yes, um, which he, he shared with his, with his brother. Um, Hannah was not too happy about that, no, as you could can imagine. imagine. But yes. uh, um, Samuel's answer to that was that I, I don't actually, you know, I, I treat my slaves well, if you like. A dubious claim, to say the least, and one that surely festered in the mind of Mrs. Gregg. Regardless, Hannah preoccupied herself and made it her mission to provide the best education she could for her children. So Sue, we have some very uh, interesting documents we here. Do, I understand yes. that you've brought these out specially for especially us. Especially for us, yes, especially for you, yes, yes. So these are normally kept in the archives. Um, what we have here is the um, what Hannah started was her Dudecimo du Society. So really it's a, um, an idea of sort of discussions amongst uh, her children. Mm -hmm. And quite often the easiest way to explain it would be that she would write a topic or yeah. sort of you know, do a topic. Each of her children would then sort of go away, write a essay on that topic. And that would then sort of be put into a box and you, she would draw one out and then they would all have to discuss it. And then obviously they would all sort of chip in with their little bits and pieces, if you like. Oh, but it was okay. scientific, it was geographical, it covered everything. So right? she clearly cares a lot about she does. her children's education. education. You don't see that a lot, a lot of the time. No, you don't, no. So I'm intrigued by uh, this enormous letter, Sue. Um, it's uh, her eldest son. It's, it's uh, words of encouragement. But yeah. he's the eldest and he's not inheriting... This bill no, is he? He's, he's not, going no. to London. He is going to London, yes. It was her second son, Robert Hyde Gregg, actually, who, who inherited. Um, he just obviously was, was not interested in the, in the business here. He wanted to make his own way in life. Close attention was clearly paid to the development and needs of the children. But was anything done to help the mill workers? The Greggs became rich off of the exploitation of child labour, that's simply a fact. But steps were taken, presumably under the influence of Hannah Gregg and her philanthropic views, to improve workers' welfare. A concept that was fashionable among liberal mill owners was the factory colony. The idea was that providing workers with decent accommodation and facilities close to the cotton mill itself would keep them loyal. Why would they go looking for alternative employment when they had such a good deal? In the 1820s, the Greggs developed the hamlet of Style close to Quarry Bank Mill and made it into what they considered a model village. And this is it, Style Village. It's about five minutes walk from the mill, and it hasn't changed much since it was first built by the Gregg family in the early 19th century. All right. There's absolutely no doubt that living here would have been preferable to conditions endured by mill workers in big cities. 
In Manchester, for example, the huge influx of people seeking better paid work in factories was initially too much for the authorities to handle. As poor quality housing was thrown up to accommodate the new arrivals, sewage systems were often overwhelmed, and diseases like typhus, cholera and smallpox spread quickly through overcrowded neighbourhoods. Now, church on Sunday would have been an important focus for community life. And as it happens, the 18th and 19th centuries were a time of profound religious change. There were all kinds of sects breaking away from the traditional Church of England. This place, Norcliffe Chapel, was built by the Greggs and was used first by Baptists and then by Unitarians. But Unitarians, including the Greggs themselves, were known as dissenters and they were barred from many areas of public life. It might not have been comparable to the luxury of Quarry Bank House, but the cottages in style would have been considered comfortable by the standards of the time. Each one would have housed around seven people, but occasionally up to 14. In Manchester, you could find 30 people crammed into a single cellar. Ah, I think it's this one. Home sweet home. Right, come in. Right, let's take a look around. So I think this room we've got here, this is the parlour. As you can see, it's not huge. You've got seven or eight people living in here, socialising, relaxing, if relaxing was possible. Not too much space. It's been updated a little bit. I mean, this fireplace, I think, is from the early 1900s. You've obviously got electrics now. But this place is known as the Pickled Cottage because it's sort of been left to almost stew in its own history since it was vacated in the 1970s. Built in the 1820s, along with all the other cottages in style. Let's go through to the kitchen, see what we've got to offer in here. Also the scullery, it's known as. You can imagine cooking for a huge family in here. People in those days would have been used to much more cramped spaces. Ideas of privacy were very different at that point. Let's go check out the bedrooms. Okay, it's not a bad size. It's not a bad size. And remember, there's two of these. But when you think maybe 10 people were sleeping in here, everyone who lived in this house from the 1820s up until the 1970s, we know was an employee of the Greggs. Some of them were laborers, some of them were weavers. Some of them were estate workers. You've certainly got nice views here. This would have been completely different if you were living in the centre of Manchester in the, in the slums where mill workers were crammed into there. Not bad. By 1840, Stile was a large and thriving village with around 300 tenants, almost all employed by the Greggs. Not all of them worked at the mill though. There were also farmers, bookkeepers, gardeners and shoemakers living here, to name just a few of the occupations recorded. However, details of their private lives are hard to come by. We know there was a women's social club here, one of the first in the country, as well as a style club room which hosted theatrical performances and had its own library. The Greg set it up to keep workers out of the local pub, the Ship Inn, which was clearly popular. Now, you might think there's quite a lot of people crammed into this space, but that's not it. Down in the cellar, there might be another family. Right, let's take a look at the cellar. Wow. Apparently one of these cellars would have housed up to five people. If they weren't being used to house people, they were still being put to good use. Sometimes as storerooms, sometimes they'd be preaching down here, and otherwise they might be used for a bit of a side hustle. So this particular cellar was apparently used in the early 20th century as both a laundrette and a fish and chip shop in the same week. 
Can't imagine those clothes would have smelled good. There were still some features of life in style we might find a bit sinister. Rent for accommodation and purchases from the local shop weren't paid for in cash, but were deducted straight from a worker's salary. It was a system that strongly discouraged people from leaving the village. I think what the Greggs workers in style would have really appreciated is having access to their own privy in their own backyard. In Manchester, they'd be sharing a toilet with the entire street. Having it here, even though you were sharing with maybe 14 people, meant that diseases were less likely to spread and workers were healthier. Now, I only have my own lawn. When staying at the property, the Greggs could enjoy 400 acres of beautiful woodland and countryside surrounding the peaceful River Bolin. The estate was designed as a picturesque landscape for the Gregg family to enjoy, with six ornamental bridges, steep-sided gorges, caves, cliffs and a variety of trees. The estate and mill were inherited by Samuel's son, Robert Hyde Gregg, and eventually by his great-grandnephew, Alexander Carlton Gregg, who donated the site in 1939 to the National Trust. The mill continued in production until 1959, but with the slow maturing of the market and increased competition from abroad, the profits had begun to dwindle long before it finally closed. During Quarry Bank's time in operation, the lives of the working class had changed dramatically. Britain's agricultural economy had been transformed into an industrial one, bringing with it new ways of working, new cities, canals and factories, and new grievances. From the Luddite weavers who smashed the textile machinery which put their livelihoods at risk, to the Chartists who believed people should have proper representation in Parliament. Ordinary workers were prepared to force through change by any means necessary. The Greggs and many other industrialists often found themselves on the wrong side of the argument, opposing various factory acts which began the process of regulating working conditions and hours over the 19th century. But progress was still slow. It wasn't until 1933 that full-time work was banned for school-aged children. Paid holidays weren't permitted for working-class people until 1938. Well, hello, my good friend and fellow worker. Might I say, this industrial revolution has been rather splendid, hasn't it? Has it? Why, yes! With my trust, my dedication, my investment, and your toil, of course, we've made fortunes for so many across this land. And we've made this country one of the richest and most technologically advanced on this planet. Listen, let's talk about my toil. I've had to endure uncapped hours, no workers' rights, dust, disease, the prospect of death at 35. I've not had a lot to look forward to. Oh, golly. Well, at least you had your own house to live in. Yeah, with a dozen other people. I had to share a bed with three people I barely knew. Oh, well, um, I'm sure you're all good friends by now, hey? Anyway, uh, moustache, no rest for the wicked. No rest? I've got to get back to work. Welcome to the History Hit YouTube channel. Hope you enjoyed that video. And if you'd like to see more videos where we attempt to try and bring history to life, uh, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. Cheers, guys. See you soon.